Imagine, if you will, uh, that uh, the Nazis won the Second World War and got to do what they wanted to do in Eastern Europe, i.e. Um, exterminate uh, the Slavic and Jewish uh, inhabitants of that part of the world, Eastern Europe, um, and repopulate it with Germans, with a population that they had uh, determined would boom after the war that the Nazis had determined would happen. Um, so they build all these large cities and factories and infrastructure in the East, uh, where previously things had been relatively primitive, um, at least compared to, say, I don't know, the Ruhr Valley in Germany or various other bits where the economy and industry is very, uh, very advanced compared to what was there before the Germans arrived. Um, so there's all these super cities built in the East, um, lots of high-tech uh, improvements. Uh, the place is populated by highly educated, uh, orderly people. Um, you know, two feet below everybody's feet is a couple of dead Russians or Jews or whatever. Um, but, you know, say somebody from a part of the world that, had, that, that knew nothing of the history of this went and visited Germany afterwards. Uh, what would they conclude what would they, when they looked at the, the way that things were in what became Germany, i.e. what's now Russia is now part of Germany? They'd say, wow, what a great uh, civilization you people have created. <laughs> um, you know, I, I heartily approve of all of it. You've created a wonderful, uh, almost utopian civilization. And then somebody takes this person aside and says, guess what we had to do to <laughs> achieve all of this? <laughs> um, I don't know, 100 million dead people <laughs> wiped out because they were superfluous, deleted, as I said before. Um, this is what happens when you apply an ism to your ethics and you, you know, or, or this is a danger. This is what can happen. I shouldn't say that it's guaranteed to happen, but, you know, that's just a good case. You know, the Nazis are wonderful at that, providing us with, you know, all these moral benchmarks as to what not to do. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a cautionary tale when you decide that you're going to run your society according to some sort of ism, even with the best of intentions. Or um, if you just sort of say, okay, right now we're going to do some surgery on Eastern Europe and cut out the cancer. It just so happens that the cancer is, you know, 100 million people, but whatever, you know, it's unfortunate. But, you know, as totalitarians always say, when you chop wood, chips fly. In other words, people get hurt when you do uh, important jobs. That was actually Nikolai Yezhov who said that, uh, the Stalin's mass murderer. Um, now, Singer comes up with some interesting ideas, and I think I understand what he's trying to accomplish with it. I certainly don't think he's a Nazi. <laughs> he always gets sort of accused of that, especially, I guess, in Germany. And I can understand why Germans might want to sort of say, look, uh, <laughs> this kind of thinking um, where you subordinate humanity to an idea can be very problematic. Um, Singer seems to be um, willing to entertain a discussion on the idea of infanticide. Um, eh, interesting bit of synchronicity there. I wonder if you heard that, my son screaming. <laughs> um, and um, infanticide was essentially what human birth control was prior to the uh, introduction of the birth control pill. Uh, we've all seen uh, the 300, and in, um, in the beginning of that, you see that the Spartan elders um, killed any child that was not deemed to be perfect, physically perfect, suitable to be a Spartan warrior. Spartan citizen, full citizen, a peer, as they called them. Um, that's actually just part of the tale. Everywhere else in classical antiquity, it was up to the father to decide whether or not his newborn son lived or died. Um, in Sparta, the elders decided it, and that's what made Sparta unique. Uh, but any father in any uh, classical Mediterranean society had the right of life and death over his children. Uh, newborns, at least, and um, he had the right to expose them to the elements and let the gods reclaim them uh, if he 
had too many kids or he didn't want a girl or he didn't want a boy for whatever reason, you could just leave the kid out in a designated spot. The kid would starve, freeze, whatever, to death. Uh, died of neglect. Nobody killed it. It just died. Um, you know, it's... It, the Nazis were doing stuff like this as well. They were they were reintroducing ancient ideas that had gone out of vogue, and they were just sort of blasting people with this new idea that you know we can we can question everything now. Uh, you know, it's the, the Hitler's famous quote: "Yeah, you call us barbarians. Of course, we're barbarians." <laughs> and and people just weren't weren't ready for that. weren't ready for someone blatantly saying that your whole idea of civilization is garbage to us and we want to throw it all down the drain and uh, start all over again with an entirely different set of ethics. Um, that bit of Nazi history has been glossed over. The fact that they were more or less resurrecting old ideas. They weren't actually creating a lot of new ideas. Um, the Romans would have seen nothing wrong with genocide if it was expedient, if it solved a problem that they believed was pressing enough. They'd wipe out an entire people if they had to. Um, you know, this is nothing new. Um, but that's what you get, though, when you put an ism or a sort of, I don't know, idea ahead of humanity, um, or at least an immutable idea. Um, I always sort of praise the French Republic in that its general thrust is uh, not utilitarian, it's the social contract. Um, interestingly, um, I've also got a lot of, you know, decent things to say about British uh, common law. Um, it's like, okay, right now things are the way they are, but all new changes will have a utilitarian thrust to them, generally speaking. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's always provisions for minorities, etc., uh, that is kind of social contract-ish as well. Um, the real sort of idealistic republic now, I think, is the U.S., um, where you know they want to find out who the good people and who the bad people are. There's a powerful moral thrust behind it. Canada is kind of the same way, at least in our thinking. Uh, we've inherited the British system of reform as opposed to revolution or or having absolute ideas like a constitution or something like that that uh, supersede absolutely everything. Um, <clears throat> you know, we go by sort of we correct the system as it go as the system as as circumstances change. So it's kind of a social contract, and really, so is the U.S. Really, it's just a question of emphasis. But what Singer's doing, I think, is he's trying to resurrect the idea of having um, an ism up there that is the uh, litmus test for absolutely everything. And again, you get weird situations like um, bestiality being uh, considered okay or whatever. Um, a lot of his reasoning seems to be, well, if we've already established this, then we can extrapolate further along. We, you know, we've got a syllogism here, ethically speaking. Bad idea, because again, it, it, it gets into that weird rolling window of totalitarian certainty that I referred to in a few years, a few dozen videos back where um, we um, what is true now has always been true for the purposes of the law and ethics and we, if we change the law then we have to assume that it was always like that traffic helicopter you don't know it's a military one whatever um, <clears throat> so um, yeah that's that's the the thing about utilitarianism, um, especially, you know, of that kind. I don't think that Singer is particularly dangerous as a human being, um, not really at all, but it's just the idea that he's willing to introduce these ideas as absolutes that can lead to nasty situations. You know, it's the, the exceptions that bear looking at. Um, <clears throat> as I say, you, you land in, I don't know, Smolensk, um, <clears throat> The year is 2015. The Nazis had won the war in 1945. And you look at it and you go, what's wrong with this? It's just a very nice version of Berlin. Very ultra-modern. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Rewind and look at what went into making that situation possible, and you'll see what it is. 
Um, one of the one of the interesting examples of uh, of the um, non-idealistic way of dealing with things is the Indian Republic. Uh, India is just a mass of competing interests, castes, communities, different versions, offshoots of different castes and everything. And the system has an enormous capacity to reinvent itself. Um, <clears throat> and the Indian Republic, even though it, there's no legal sanction placed on the caste system at all, thoroughly deals with it. Uh, it's just a reality that has to be dealt with. It's not that the Indians are particularly enamored of their caste system. That's, you know, they, they might rigidly stick to it. But as an actual idea, most Indian people don't really have great things to say about it. But it's it, the idea, the thinking is, this is better than the alternative. Um, if we if we decide that we're just going to have a utilitarian republic, not based on the social contract, watch what happens. <laughs> um, you want to destroy Indian society and cause Hobbesian chaos to break out on a massive scale, somehow wave a magic wand and abolish uh, the caste system. Bad idea. Just because we don't like one system doesn't mean that we automatically supersede it just because we can, regardless of unintended consequences. Um, the caste system might be, in our modern view of things, uh, a, um, I don't know, something of a anachronistic abomination. But that's reality. What are you going to do about that? Try and change a country of a billion people with a 3,000-year history. Try and change it quickly and watch what happens. In the meantime, we're left with blundering on. I prefer that, I think, to sudden violent change based on some sort of ism. I understand that we want to make sure that we don't have a repeat of what we went through in the 19, or in the, you know, the 20th century. But, um, you don't do that by just finding a betterism that's equally pitiless.